Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Political Vigilante. My name is Graham Elwood. We have a very special returning guest, friend of the show, Jeff Epstein, not the one who hung himself with a paper um, T-shirt, the one from Citizens Media TV who has educated myself and many of you about MMT uh, and also co-host of the podcast, and he's known on Twitter as at Activist MMT. Check out the Activist MMT podcast. Jeff, thank you so much for coming back on the show. You're the one who, uh, it's almost two years ago now, that that reached out to me and and started to wake me up on MMT. As a result, I have a whole MMT playlist, which is a great resource. Anytime somebody comes on my live stream, is like, what is this MMT? What does this mean? I was just going to just watch this um, watch this this playlist, and there's all the interviews with you and Fidel Kaboob and Stephen Hale. And so now MMT is kind of coming back into the conversation because we're seeing the Federal Reserve, <laughs> well, in addition to the trillions of dollars they've just been giving Wall Street since the fall, I guess, to, to keep the economy <laughs> inflated. You'll get more into that. We mm-hmm. just had the stimulus plan where, uh, you know, oh, the small business, $350 billion, that ran out in literally a manner of minutes. But the mm-hmm. four point well, a half hour. Yeah, half hour. Okay, that's fair. I'm sorry. I, I, I overreacted to Steve Mnuchin's great plan. Um, but the $4.25 trillion that went to the banks and Wall Street, boy, that money, that, that's still plenty of that to go around. That is exactly what we're going to talk about today. And actually, uh, uh, I, I just spoke to someone in Scotland who was telling me about how the UK, uh, basically their treasury secretary called something else, said, uh, we're just going to do $350 billion stimulus for coronavirus on top of the budget. And, you know, no questions of who, how we're going to pay for it. And yet, two months previous, the news never asked, or no, the news always asked, pummeled the uh, Labor Party's manifesto, which cost about $400 trillion over 10 years. But they just created $350 billion in a moment for coronavirus. Just like that. And just all of like the that. how we're going to pay for it voices that we heard literally two months ago when Bernie was still, before he just fucking quit, that's a separate conversation, but... When everyone was like, how are we going to pay for Bernie's Medicare for all and student debt? How are we going to pay for all these pie in the sky things? We're not hearing the how we're going to pay for it anymore because people are like, I need money. I can't pay my rent. We may- because as, as Joe Biden said, it, this is a crisis now. We yes. will deal with these other crises later. This is a crisis now, which really is neoliberal for this is a crisis for the privileged. Yes. We don't care about the crisis for the for the disadvantage that happens all the time. We care about the crisis right now for the privileged. <laughs> so, all right, you let let's get into it because we're seeing and everyone's like, "Wait, well, how does the Federal Reserve work and how can they just issue currency and stuff like that?" So, you put together uh, another yeah. fantastic presentation. So, to our viewers at home, you're you're just there in the corner and we got this cool presentation. So, let's let's go into um, yes. And, and by the way, I want to tell people um, that uh, – I'm sorry, there, that this – I will put this PDF in the show notes if you want to follow along with us or go over it later. But it's a presentation that Jeff put together. So here is the first slide. Okay. So, Graham, I want to say, yes, it, it's been about two years now, June of 2018. Uh, You have come a long way. Holy cow. (laughs) Watching you say stuff like this on this slide right here with confidence now, you just say it with confidence. It is such, it is just such a nice thing to see. And I'm really proud to have been, you know, some part of that. It's just really wonderful. So now it is time to go deeper. It's time to go deeper. Uh, So uh, next, if I may. Actually, not actually, just uh, so, you know, endless war is bad, not because we need the money, but because it's immoral. Taxing the rich, we need to because they're too powerful. We don't need their money. And yes, the Federal Reserve creates money. We just use a computer to mark up the size of the account. And mark up is just simply defined as make a number bigger. That's and all it means. That is a direct quote from, uh, I think it was Ben, ben Bernanke. Bernanke. Yeah, on 60 Minutes. Ben Bernanke. That's right. You play that. You play that in, uh, I think, in one of your Federal Reserve videos, right? I did, and um, and I've seen Stephanie Kelton. She retweeted that. So that's that's how the Federal Reserve can just create. We're a monetary sovereign, which means we can. That's, we holy our, cow! That's <laughs> that's having lunch with uh, with awesome. Stephen Hale in uh, in Adelaide when Ron and I were on tour. So that's wonderful. <laughs> thank the network uh, of he had, he had coronavirus. Pardon. 
Stephen got Stephen got coronavirus. Oh, he man. gave a, he, he spent his time with his coronavirus, or he's pretty sure he didn't get tested, but he's pretty sure he gave a lecture on MMT and coronavirus to keep himself busy while he was. He seems to be totally recovered now. Wow. Well, that's good to hear, Stephen. If yeah. you're watching, glad you're better. Um, all right. So let's go to the next slide here. Okay. So in the past month. You gave uh, two presentations, about two, two videos on the Federal Reserve. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to read the titles. It's a little small, but people will see in the PDFs. March 13th, Fed gives banks $1.5 trillion and Americans zero during the pandemic. On April 6th, you did another one that was titled, Federal Reserve pays, bank, pays banks overnight while America starves. Go ahead. So your main point is absolutely right. I mean, just you're totally, you get what's going on. The elite steal from us. The government uses their immense powers to bail out the, these criminals. So, and they, but they turn to us, the millions of desperate people, and say we have tough choices to make and fiscal responsibility, even during this health crisis, no matter how desperate we are. And the elite steal from us again. So that's absolutely, totally, totally correct. Go ahead. I'm going to give two simplistic examples before we go on to give a, a basis, a background for what we're going to talk about. So example number one, let's pretend that the Congress, as it, as it, is a, as it does according to the Constitution, Congress tells Federal Reserve to, which I'm going to, you can abbreviate to, the Fed. Congress tells the Fed to create $1,000. That $1,000 through a series of steps is given to you, basically because you did some work, you got a paycheck. You are now a thousand dollars richer. Okay, uh, this window's in my way. Uh, so this is you can just you know it's a grant. You can do whatever you like with it, right? We're going to call this a net financial asset. Okay? okay, money that you get and you can just do whatever you like. You don't owe it to anyone. It is a net financial asset. Go ahead. Example number two. The Fed creates $1,000 on its own without new permission from Congress. And let's pretend that the Fed gives that $1,000 to you. However, it is only on the condition that you give the $1,000, you give a bond worth $1,000 back to the Fed. Okay? They give you a $1,000 check. You must give them, in this case, a $1,000 bond. Now, my question is, if, are you in a better position than you were? The same position that you were, or in a worse position? Well, let's you, go to the, the, uh, another question. I'm sure a lot of my viewers are having. I'm not. Wait a minute. Can you explain what a bond is? A bond is uh, you buy a, a piece of paper from the government. It says uh, you write you write your name on it. Graham Elwood, thousand bucks or ten bucks or fifty bucks, but let's say a thousand dollars. And in five years, you will get a thousand dollars back plus however much interest is on that bond. Let's say five percent. Okay. So you buy a bond from the government. You, it, which five years later, you go back to the government and they give you $1,000 plus 5% compounding interest, which is, you know, a decent amount of money. I don't know, $5,300 or $1,300 or whatever it is. I, I have no idea what the actual amount is. So this, the Federal Reserve gives you 1000 bucks, but only in exchange for a $1,000 bond. Are you in a better position, same position, or worse position than before? Well, wow, that's a great question. I would say, well, I guess five years from now, I'll be in a slightly better position because the only net gain, if I understand this correctly, is whatever the interest was. Let's say, let's say five years from now, it's a thousand fifty dollars. So I made fifty bucks. That's that's if you have the bond. That's correct. But in this scenario, the Fed gave you a thousand. You gave the Fed your thousand dollar bond. Well, I guess it would be. Oh, if I'm issuing the bond? No, no, no. You don't issue the bond. You bought the bond a long time ago. Just whatever. You just bought it. Oh, so I've had that $1,000 bond for a while. Right. And I'm and giving it back to them in exchange for cash. Correct. Are you in a better position now, a worse position, or the same position? I guess, well, the same or even maybe a slightly less position because now, if I understand this correctly, I just gave up that whatever, let's call it $50 in interest I would have made. You just gave up an in interest-bearing financial instrument in exchange for cash, which does not earn any interest, right? Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. You are in a slightly worse position. 
The only thing that's better about it is that cash is more liquid, which, which just means accessible. You can spend that money without having to do anything further because it's cash. A bond, you have to you know, redeem and then spend. But the bad side is, is that cash does not earn interest. The bond does earn interest. So overall, you're sort of in a worse, slightly worse position because now you have money that's not earning interest where you did have money that was earning interest. And this is really similar to moving your money from a savings account to a checking account. Okay. Because the checking account earns no interest, the savings account does earn interest. And the savings account is less liquid, and the checking account is more liquid, more accessible, more easily spent. Okay? This is called an asset swap. Okay? So this is a net financial asset where you get money and it's just yours to keep. You don't have to exchange or give anything for it. I mean, you worked for it, but... Or an asset swap where you exchanged a, an interest-bearing financial instrument, just a fancy word, for cash. Okay? Mm-hmm. Asset swap. Next, please. So net financial asset. Asset swap. Net financial asset happens in the real world. Asset swaps in this scenario, in this story we're going to go into, happens in a different world. Happens in the underground plumbing. So next, please. Almost all of the examples in your Federal Reserve videos are asset swaps. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to get into why that's true and uh, your overall tenor of what you're upset about is absolutely right, but what you're focusing on, the specific details in these Federal Reserve videos, doesn't is not an example of that anger. Okay, so I just okay. missed that detail in those videos is what you're saying. Right, right. Okay. And now you're, after this video, you're going to understand a lot more about it. Great. And this is basically just taking that absolutely correct anger and assessment and focusing in a little more accurate direction. <laughs> I mean, honestly. So go, so go on. Okay. Um, here we go. So this is a basic introduction. I talked with an, uh, an expert on Thursday night for two solid hours to make sure that I had, this is generally correct, but this is a basic layperson introduction. My goal is so that hopefully you and your viewers might consider learning more from experts. Um, so, next please. No, I want to go back to work because COVID, I need to go back. I want to protest. The protest with your down. guns in the Congress and your MAGA hats? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> How can I sell Confederate flags if you can't if I can't go back to work? Um, so, all right, here we go. All right, so the real economy and the banking reserve system, two different worlds, and barely they connect. They do they barely they barely connect to each other. The, the real economy reserve system. This is basically you're talking about how the Federal Reserve works with like Wall Street. Uh, yes, uh, yes, and that's what we're going to get into. Okay. We're going to go into the details of that. Okay. So the real economy, next slide, please. The real economy is the world that we live in, the money we have, the credit cards we take, the loans we take out, banks, credit card m- mortgages, mm-hmm. payday loans, student loans, the physical stores we walk into, banks we walk into, the online stores and banks we log on to. That's our economy, the real economy. Next, please. There is another completely separate world that is almost entirely irrelevant to our lives. And that is called the banking reserve system. It's like the plumbing, the sewage, sewer system underneath the streets. Okay? There, the Federal Reserve creates tons of money in this system, but it never leaves that system. It never goes to any individual person's hand. I don't care how rich and elite they are. It never touches, they never, in, no individual touches the money in that system. It's called reserves. Okay. It's called reserves. It's just the money in the banking reserve system is called reserves. So all of that money that you talk about, you know, creating quickly and 1.5 trillion, all that stuff, that happens to be examples of asset swaps in the banking reserve system that no individual touches. No executive or CEO at big corporations touch or have or are given. So uh, hold on a moment. Sorry. Uh, there we go. Okay. Next, please. So the Federal Reserve has two major roles. One of those roles is in the real economy, and that is creating net financial assets, which is basically grants, money you can just do whatever you like with. Net financial assets in the real economy. economy. Let me just clarify here. So when you talk about grants, 
let's talk about just a, 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 re, um, a recent example. So that small business loan that they talked about, that $350 billion that we talked about that went out, that went out the door in 30 minutes, that's one of the, is that what you're talking about? Like the small well, you, business that's a loan. loan. Okay. A loan is something that must be repaid. But they said so that's, under that loan, if you used it for, let's say, payroll, then you didn't have to pay it back and it okay. just became a grant? Okay, well, and that, if that's the case, then, then after it's no longer a loan, then I guess it's a net okay. financial asset. Okay, great. Yes. Okay. okay, so when a bill becomes law, it has spending in it, and the Fed, as part of a larger process, ends up creating some of that money, which becomes net financial assets in the real economy. Okay, right. that is money that you know. Basically, we work and we get a paycheck, but once we've done the work, now the money is ours to keep. Okay, the other one is in the banking reserve system. They create tons of money in the banking reserve system for the purpose of asset swaps, and the only reason that they do that is to maintain the stability of the banking system, the banking reserve system. Next, please. So the Federal Reserve, now we're going to go into an example of the real economy version, the, con the version that we're familiar with, that we know that they do. So I'm going to give an example of how, an example of that. So the Federal Reserve is part of a much larger process, plays a part in a large process. Uh, so let's pretend that Medicare for All just became law. Hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> it, has, it has $1 trillion in new spending, okay? Let's say. Pretend it has $1 trillion in new spending, and the purpose of that spending, let's pretend, is to build new wings on the hospitals all across the country. Okay, next slide, please. That $1 trillion in spending, new hospital wings, new hospital wings require to be built, the materials to build them, the labor to build them, mm -hmm. all of the staff to, pr to uh, work in it, all of the furniture, computers, equipment, medicine, to that go in it to maintain it going forward. Security, administration, parking attendance, whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's everything that the bill specifies is necessary to build these hospitals. Next, please. That the money is going to, to pay for these physical things you're talking about. Labor and physical resources. Right. Okay. So this elaborates on just that. So the Medicare for All All has a trillion dollars in spending. Some of it goes to a furniture company. Some of it goes to a pharmaceutical company, mm -hmm. security company, and all this stuff. All specified in the law. Okay. Then the workers are paid for doing the labor, for gathering the resources, for manipulating the resources, and for you know going on forward. And then some of those workers spend money in other stores that don't have anything to do with this law, but they support the people who do the things that make that law become a reality, that build those hospitals and maintain, so grocery stores and movie, th movie theaters and so on and so on, okay? So that's, how, that's just an example of how money works its way from the government all the way through the economy, even for stores that have nothing to do with implementing a law like a grocery store, okay? okay? Paychecks are basically net financial assets for exchange, in exchange for labor, Okay, and resources, okay. gathering resources. Okay, next please. Let me just look at this real quick. Okay, I see. Sure. Okay, I see. So there's where the trillion gets spread out. Okay, security, computer, construction, workers, paychecks, thing, insurance, whatever, all that stuff. And then, right, the workers' paychecks go to pay all the, okay, good. And again, okay. everybody watching, this will be in the show notes. Now, this is the part where you're going to need to buckle up. You're not, this is not for memorization. This is, not, this is just to get an understanding of how things actually work. And it is ridiculous. Just giving you a warning. But this is how it works. This is how it works. I, first of all, I don't believe you because our system is so perfect. There's no corruption. Nothing was stacked up from the beginning to help the 1%. But go forward, Jeff, with whatever crazy tinfoil hat, flat earth nonsense you want to tell us. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Congress writes the bill and passes it into law. No, excuse me, passes it. Then the president signs it into law. Mm -hmm. Okay. That law has spending in it, has new spending declared in it, uh, allocated, I forget the exact term, allocated in it. That spending is intended to make that bill a reality. In this case, building hospitals and all that stuff. Okay? 
labor, and stuff to make that bill a re- to make that new law a reality. That spending instructs the Treasury to spend. Okay. The Treasury, not the Federal Reserve, the Treasury. Next, please. The Treasury has a bank account at the Fed, just like the banks. The Treasury, okay, so they have what's called, they just call it a Treasury spending account, okay? Mm-hmm. Treasury looks in its account, and it has however much money it already currently has for whatever reasons, and let's say that it has $800 billion right now. So it needs $200 billion more in order to reach that $1 trillion that it is now required to spend. Okay? So it goes to the bank, the Federal Reserve Bank, its bank, and makes a deposit. Just like we, me and you, we go to a bank, we give a deposit slip, and we have cash or bonds or whatever. Checks. Well, let's just, let, let me just break this down real simple. So let's say I have to write a check for $1,000. I have $800 in one account and I need 200 more dollars. I get and I liquidate let's say I liquidate a a a a stock bond, a stock a stock portfolio. I I, I sell $200 worth of stock and then I take that $200 and I deposit it in my account to give me up to 1000 to pay this check that I wrote. And the bank is required to give it to you, no questions asked, there's no controversy involved. So the treasury has obviously a little more special powers than that, but that is basically it. Okay. So they, have, they need $200 billion more in this example to get up to $1 trillion, which they must do because that's what the law says that they must do. They go to the treasury with their deposit slip and their whatever else, cash, treasuries, whatever it is, and the Fed now marks up the treasury's account – by using a computer to mark up the size of the account that they have at the Fed by $200 billion. So now the Treasury has $1 trillion. Now the Fed is done. Fed's done. And where did Next that $200 step. billion come from? Uh, came from a computer that they used to mark up the size of the account that they had at the Fed. So, so they changed $800 billion, and they changed that eight to They changed that 8 to a 10, and now it's $1 billion, $1 trillion. So correct me if I'm wrong, but let's say I had $800 in my checking account and you're the manager of my local branch and I say, hey, I got, I got to write a $1,000 check and I'm 200 shy and you won't just fill out this deposit slip. There's no money. I've given you no cash. I've deposited no nothing. I just give it to you and then you go on your computer and change my checking account to say a, from $800 to $1,000. I'll change it to a trillion, Graham. But, uh, but no, I just want to make this point. No, but, but I, th- this is the part that I am actually learning about myself. The Treasury does give something, but that doesn't mean that the Fed doesn't create it out of thin air because they do. And that's the part I'm unclear on. Okay. But I'm going to talk about that later. You know, this is what we need to, both of us need to talk with experts about to get sure. more into. But they do give a deposit slip and something and i'm not exactly sure what that something is it in- includes like revenue they've gotten from taxes and and you know even coins and whatever but i am not exactly sure about that part of it but none of this changed the fact that the federal reserve uses a computer to mark up the size of the account that they have at the fed and if you were a local bank manager and you did that for my account that is called a felony <laughs> okay just I want I want to understand that so the audience understands that. So when because we the it, government is a monopoly currency issuer, the yeah. bank is not. They can create loans for you out of thin air, mm-hmm. same kind of way, but it's a very different thing because you immediately owe it in all hundred percent plus interest. Totally different. Not a net financial asset. Yep. All right, next please. Now, final step. Now the treasury has a trillion dollars in its bank account. Okay. In its treasury spending account at the Fed. And now they go through the steps in the bill and give that amount of money to each company in their own banks. So it says furniture company A in step one, PNC Bank, $50 million. It goes, so, so just it, to make sure, I just want to really spell this out for myself and for the audience. So the furniture company, their accounts are in PNC Bank. So then the treasury distributes – the $50 million to the furniture company's bank. They mark up the size of the account that the furniture company has at PNC, and they mark down their treasury spending account by that much. Okay. So you'll, you see it gradually go down. So I just want to clear, make this clear for the audience. 
what these different banks are. This is the bank just in this hypothetical where construction company B, they do business at Wells Fargo, so then they get $1.2 billion. That number goes down from the, TS, from the Treasury. Um, TSA, yep. Treasury, account. Spending account, Treasury, Treasury spending, spending account, spending account, TSA. Okay. Um, I want to spell, I want to say Treasury because I don't want people to get confused with the... Uh, treasury spending account. Yeah, Treasury spending account. Pharmaceutical, same thing. There with TD Bank, these, these are all the hypotheticals in this trillion dollar Medicare for all plan. And so every time they just mark up this account, they take it out of there. So they're not really physically transferring the money the way I would transfer money to you, correct? You're, they are simply lowering a number here, raising a number here. Okay. There, there's, not a, there's not an inherent connection. They are right. choosing to lower a number here, raise a number here. Which is different than They're not like, picking it up and moving it over. If I transferred money to you, I was actually, well, digitally, my account would say $1,000, and then I would be transferring that money to your account. If I, let's say I transferred $50, then I, then I would literally be taking that money, but they're not doing that. Uh, well, actually, when you transfer money to me, is if it's electronic, it's the same thing. Number okay. goes down, number goes up. There's no inherent. There's no inherent uh, connection between the two. There's no picking up and dropping. It's just a, it's just a, a choice that we've made. They lower it here, that which okay. and raise it here. Okay. If you hand me a piece of cash, then yeah, sure, it moves physically moves from sure. here to there. I take yeah, I, I take a twenty dollar yes. bill out of my wallet, give it to you, you put it in your wallet, then a physical transaction happens. But digitally, okay, all right, just clarifying that. Yep. So at the end of all the companies being paid, that treasury service savings, uh, tre treasury spending account gets down to zero. All of the companies have what they need, and now they do what they're contracted to do with their federal contract to implement this law. Okay. Okay. This is the step that's called spending, where it, the money that was in the reserve banking system has crossed that border into the real economy. That's called spending. That that transfer by the treasury only, by the treasury only, from the reserve banking system to the real economy, that is the very nature of what it means for the government to spend. You're lowering a number in the reserve banking system, raising it in the real economy in one of these bank accounts. Only the treasury can do this. Okay. So that is the very nature of spending. Next, please. The treasury is who creates net financial assets in the real economy. The Federal Reserve is an important part of that process because the treasury can't mark up their own accounts. They have this rigmarole of, of process that they require to happen. But the treasury is who ultimately takes the newly created money by the Fed and marks up the actual accounts in the real economy. And that crossing of the border between the reserve banking system and the real economy that is the very nature of how the government creates money. Ah, uh, okay. okay. Okay? So that, you, you know, this is, this is intense, and I'm just learning this myself. But this is really how it works. And in my mind, understanding this helps reinforce all of the base, more basic stuff that we've, you know, that has, we've learned before this point. So... All right, that's good to know. Okay. Next, please. So now these companies, all of these companies now have net financial assets. They are contracted to do the work in the law, to make the law a reality. They make their workers do it, gather the resources, process the resources, do the services, and then they pay them with paychecks. And now the workers now have net financial assets. Okay? Right. All right, next. So that's now we're done with the real economy version. That's the real economy version. And the treasury part of that is 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 intense, but that's that's what it is. That's that's how it actually works. Like it's like staring at the at the face of God. Um, there is another world. There is a completely other world that we have zero awareness of. Most of us, most average people have very little awareness of, and it has very little relevance to our lives. And that is the Federal Reserve. Uh, next, please. The Federal Reserve creates reserves without prior permission of Congress, without new permission, I should say. They got permission of, uh, before. Without any new permission of Congress, they create new reserves in order to do asset swaps. 
even swaps. And the reason that they do this is to preserve the stability of the banking system, the stability of the banking reserve system, the stability of the sewer system below the streets, the plumbing that we never see. Okay, well, uh, uh, four terms, four concepts before we get into the details of that. So next, please. Uh, all of these concepts remain in the banking reserve system, all of them. None of these concepts happen in the real economy at all. Next, please. So uh, I have a definition, reserves, which you've heard this before. I have $1,000 in my bank account at Wells Fargo, my local branch down the street. Wells Fargo Corporate has $600 billion in their bank account at the Federal Reserve. That's called their reserves or their reserve account. Okay, that's in the banking reserve system. Next, please. Overnight settlement. Overnight settlement, well, there's every day in the real economy, there's about five trillion dollars in transactions every day, which is about two quadrillion dollars every year. And that's These just everything. Trans- that's just anybody buying anything at a store, online, whatever, all of them. Trading, trading, rich people buying whatever, sure. trading, whatever. Yeah. Somebody These going trans- to grantmelwood.com and buying some of my amazing merchandise that ships through the post office. You actually hand taped and stamped and licked by you (laughs) in your home. Yes. Uh, That is a significant part of the $5 trillion. Um, So every night, these transactions must be settled. Roughly speaking, every night. Periodically, these transactions must be settled. So for – and this is called – and this is called overnight settlement. Okay? Overnight settlement. Next, please. An example. My company has a bank account at TD Bank. I have a bank account at Wells Fargo. My bank, my, my company, my company gives me a paycheck for a thousand bucks. I've done some work. That money, I, then I take that paper paycheck and I hand it to Wells Fargo. I deposit it mm-hmm. with a deposit slip and my check. I give it to the teller. My bank account is not raised and their bank account is not lowered until overnight settlement occurs, which is why you often hear you'll get that money in your account in 24 hours or something like that. Right. Okay. Or when you do any sort of online transaction and it's listed as a pending transaction and on your, when you log into your bank account and it becomes a posted transaction a, a day or so later. Or whatever. That is when it has settled. Okay. That's when it's been settled. So settling my paycheck, what has happened is – my company's, pay, my company's account has gone down by 1,000. Their reserves, the bank's reserves, has gone down by 1,000. My bank's reserves has been increased by 1,000. And my bank account has been increased by 1,000. That's settlement. That's overnight settlement. Okay? Okay. All right, next. Now, there's another concept. There's another concept that I actually just learned late last night is actually – doesn't apply anymore and it has applied for many, many, many years. I don't understand the new regime, so I can't speak on it. I'm teaching the old regime. Uh, It's still valuable to understand, but I'm just letting you know that I learned last night that what I'm about to talk about has actually gone away three weeks ago after many years. Reserve requirements. Banks are required to have a certain percentage in their bank, in their reserves. So, for example, 10%, and this is what has gone down to now zero three weeks ago, but it's been this way for years. Okay. So, let's say 10%. The banks are required to have 10% in their reserve account, which is basically, roughly, the total, 10% of the total of all the accounts for all the customers at all their branches in the whole country. Next, please. Banks must comply with this reserve requirement. However, they don't want too much because if they have too much, it's like having a ton of money in your checking account when that money could be used for investments, to make interest, to make money on. You want your money to make money. You don't want it just sitting in cash in your checking account. So they want to have this 10%, but they don't want to have too much more because that checking that their reserves is essentially a checking account 
So they want it there because of the law, but they don't want too much more because they want to use it to make more money. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. So now other banks might want uh, – excuse me, next. Other banks might not have enough. For whatever reason, they might have under 10%. So what they can do is they can purchase excess reserves from other banks. And the other bank gets some interest in return. That would be a swap of like a bond or whatever, and they would earn some interest on that. And now both banks have the proper uh, reserve requirements, and the bank with the excess got a little bit of extra money with interest, and the bank that didn't is now not breaking the law. This is called interbank lending, interbank lending, okay? Interbank lending. Banks are lending among themselves in private in this plumbing system and the banking Which is reserve what that system. first in March 13th that 1.5 trillion dollars if I'm not mistaken that's what that was is so banks could loan each other money exactly right that's correct and we that's don't correct. get shit and we're still waiting on a $1,200 check that won't pay our rent but yeah go ahead <laughs> uh, next please if either of these processes fail we're talking catastrophe in the entire economy, including the real economy. If either of these processes, the overnight settlement or the interbank lending, fail for whatever reason, that could at an extreme result in catastrophic failure for the entire financial system, including the real economy. Next, please. And again, next. So what the Fed's job is, is to prevent failure in these systems to prevent failure in these processes. Mm, okay. And what they do is they offer new reserves, newly created reserves on a computer by marking up the size of the account on th that they have at the Fed. They offer reserves at pretty much at any time for the purposes of asset swaps, even exchanges with banks, so that they can do overnight settlement and so that they can do interbank, ex uh, uh, what did I call it? exchanges, I forget the term, interbank lending, mm -hmm. interbank lending, okay? Uh, and that can, so uh, the Federal Reserve might create $1.5 trillion, and the banks might have securities, bonds, treasuries, whatever, T-bills, whatever they are, financial instruments that, create, that earn interest and trade for those reserves so that they can do these two processes, critical processes. Next, please. This newly created money, these newly created reserves, never leave the banking reserve system. They never go into the hands of any individual executive or elite or CEO or, of course, any of us. So this money that the Fed creates with no new permission, they can just do it whenever they want, always remains in this banking reserve system in the plumbing. Okay? Next, please. So the primary job of the Federal Reserve is to manage the stability of the banking system as a whole, as a collective. They're not necessarily concerned with any individual bank. They're not concerned with any – like, for example, it's not their job that the – it's not their job that the uh, – that justice is done if there's a crime committed at a bank. That's not what the Fed does unless that happens to threaten the stability of the banking system. Okay, so this is not the Fed's job. The Fed's job is to maintain the stability of the banking system as a whole, as a collective. Next, please. Now. Well, you just want to show the New York Fed, everybody what, why, how badly I need a haircut because I'm in quarantine. Is that what this slide is for? Uh, that's <laughs> just a bonus, I guess. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, was, I really need a haircut, but go oh, ahead. Me too. Oh, my. Okay. <laughs> too. Um, uh, okay, so the New York Fed will the New York Fed will pump 1.5 trillion dollars into the short-term lending markets that banks use to lend to each other. This is an asset swap. Okay. This is not net financial assets for anyone. This is not free money for anyone. Not for executives. Not for CEOs. Not for elite. That's not what it is. It's not what it's for. It's just so these underground plumbing processes can function. Okay. Next. The central bank also announced it will buy $60 billion worth of treasury bonds 
so that the market can keep, can keep functioning appropriately. That market is the Federal Reserve System, the, the banking reserve system. Again, asset swaps. No net financial assets for anyone. No free money for anybody. This is just they're saying we're willing to do asset swaps up to $60 billion whenever you want. You must give us $60 billion in treasuries in return. Treasuries, bonds, it's just all securities are just called uh, net, uh, financial instruments, which is just like a bond that earns interest of different kinds of instruments. Bonds is an example. Okay. All right, next. The central bank said that it will up the amount it offers in overnight operations from $100 billion to $150 billion. So this increase in $150 billion, this uh, increase of $50 billion is overnight does not refer to an unusually fast period of time. It refers to overnight settlement. Okay. Okay. So you were upset about that this, oh, they can just do this overnight. And this particular example does not refer to, oh, the Fed, I mean, they can, I mean, it is true that they can, but this is something that they've always done. And it's for a specific kind of process, not an unusually fast speed. Okay. Overnight settlement is a kind of process, and this is for asset swaps to facilitate that process. Okay. Okay. Good Next one. In addition, it will increase the two-week repo operation offerings from at least $20 billion to at least $45 billion. So again, $25 billion increased in offers of asset swaps, even exchanges. Repo is just another word roughly speaking, another word for asset swap, repurchasing agreement. And actually, a massive ongoing repo, which is an asset swap, that's what QE is. It's not creation of net financial assets for bankers. It's just a massive ex offer of exchange, even exchanges. Okay. Okay. And again, this two-week operation refers to a specific process, not an unusually fast speed. And what the two weeks specifically refers to is that since transactions happen at the same time, at such high speed, at such big amounts, it is, it's virtually impossible to determine at any, any specific point in time what the balance of a bank has in all of its accounts because just things happen too quick. Mm -hmm. So what, what the Fed does is, is gives the banks two weeks to determine its average balance over that two-week period. And that is the amount, that average, is what the 10% reserve requirements is calculated based off of. So again, this two-week is not a reflection of they can just do it that quick in two weeks where we're, you know, Congress argues for generations while we don't get anything. This is a specific process. Okay. This two-week refers to a specific process. And again, for asset swaps. Next, please. Fed to step up cash injections for banks to guard against market pressure. This cat is really using cash in a very poor sense. It's really just referring to reserves for asset swaps. And market pressure is just those two processes are struggling. The Fed sees that these two processes are having problems and it needs to provide more reserves so that banks can do settlement, overnight settlement, and banks can do interbank lending okay. more easily. Okay? Uh, I think... Two more. Now, will the Fed help my family? Yes, but it's mostly indirect. That is terrible. But the Fed is not allowed to do it. The Fed's not allowed to do it. Sure. The, the government, absolutely. It, and that's really, it's misleading what this article is saying. Why would it even ask that question when the Fed's not even allowed to do it? But the government is not helping us either. And so the overall tenor of the message is exactly correct. But that, the Fed. I just want to clarify. So the the, the tenor of the message, because yes, the, the Fed just can't do it directly, but the government can say, "Hey, Fed, give us this money to help the people," and the government is not. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Exactly. So outside of the funding new laws, which was the big real economy example, the Fed is not allowed to give money to people. Just doesn't happen, whether they're rich or poor or anything. The Congress can tell them to do it through a new law through a series of steps like we, like we went through, but the Fed cannot unilaterally give people money. So that it has to be indirect. So that is misleading for even asking the question, will the Fed help my family? Yeah, that, that, that they even put that in the article is misleading. Okay. So next, last one. 
This is a little different because it's the corona part of the coronavirus relief bill. I misunderstood this as well. I thought that they were saying we're giving the Fed $454 billion and they're going to invest it and it's going to become $4 trillion and then they're just going to give that away. That's what I thought it was and I think that's what you thought you think thought it was as well. Mm-hmm. It's not what it is. $454 billion is to backstop, backstop against losses. They're, going, they're offering $4.5 trillion in loans, not free money, loans to whoever, banks, states, cities, I don't know exactly. And what they think is that 3%, roughly, 3% of these loans are going to go into default. Mm -hmm. They think that out of all the loans they give, 3% will default. So they're saying to the Fed, so to the Congress, or they say to the Congress, I think 3% is going to default. Can you give me 10% in cash so I can buffer against those losses? And that $454 is a buffer against those predicted losses. It's like three times more or something like that. So they're giving out $4.5 trillion in loans that must be paid back. I mean, maybe there's the conditions, like you said, like if they keep people on board and all that stuff. I don't, I don't exactly know how that fits in. But these are loans that must be paid back. And the $454 billion is to buffer against predicted losses. Okay. Okay. Uh, so again, it says lending programs back will back up Fed lending programs. This is not money for executives or anything like that. Okay. All right. So that's pretty much the end of the whatever the the details. And now, uh, well, I should just say, are some of these problems because of criminality, because of immorality, or is some of the Fed's actions ignoring and covering up for some? And compensating for some of that criminality, and the, and the answer is probably yes, some of it. It's probably yes. The Fed is probably nefarious in some ways. The behavior they're covering up is knowingly nefarious in some ways, but it's a it is a not a direct connection. It's a it's an indirect connection. Okay, that's fair. I mean, it's just a random coincidence that any president that said they wanted to end the Fed was assassinated, but I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you're not defending the Federal Reserve. You just this whole thing was to, was to you're not definitely not that. But yeah, it, it it the thing I would take away from this is you gave us really great clarifications, that which, which I'm glad. I I just want to get what have I said from day one on the show. I just want to get it right. And if I was wrong, I'll admit it, and I want to get it right. But let's be real clear, because I know you're not saying this either. Is that the the, the spanking Federal Reserve system? I don't think is an inherently moral system it is designed it's like a banking cartel to uh as as most things it seems as though uh, are just to keep the one percent in power <laughs> there's there's absolutely an element of that sure but but it, it, it's just less direct than and explicit than we think it is and which we're about to say the Fed is a part of this story. It's not the story. Okay. So examples of bad behaviors are down at the bottom. Bad loans, usury, fraud, robo-signing, stock buybacks. You've been hit. You know, you were hit with a, a, mm-hmm. a, a mortgage, you know, taking your house away for some of that reason. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yes, the Fed is definitely not making this situation better. However, go on, please. Who should we be angry at? We should absolutely be angry at that. And this is just my own opinion. And I, sure. I, I don't, you know, these are just some random thoughts. I haven't really, I don't feel like this is solid yet. We should be angry at the Fed because they're not regulating the banks for risky behavior and, uh, you know, big corporations, especially too big to fail. Mm-hmm. The Fed is choosing to keep us unemployed, which keeps us powerless because we are, we are powerless because we are unemployed. Mm-hmm. We should be angry with the Congress because the Fed because they give the Fed they tell the Fed what to do they're the ones the Fed is doing this because Congress says that they can do it and Congress doesn't give them hardly any oversight so yeah we should we should be angry at the Fed but they're doing what they're roughly speaking told that they can do yeah the con- we should also be angry with the Congress because they do give money directly to individuals through tax breaks and cash. They tell the Fed to do that. Yeah, that's why. And I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And they they just they they then they turn to the desperate in the middle of a pandemic 
and say, even though they have immense fiscal powers, they say fiscal responsibility and, oh, it's just such a hard choice, tough choices. It's... The thing that's so maddening about this is knowing that at the end of the day, it really comes down to Congress. And it just like, it just reminds me of two years ago, oh, we're going to take back the Congress and look what this democratically controlled Congress has done. This stimulus plan that was voted on by Democrats and Republicans, and sure, Bernie and AOC gave some speeches and they added this little thing and that little thing, but ultimately Congress could say no. This is what's happening. There's no money for the banks. This money's going directly to the people. I mean, literally, Congress could say, based on what you just told us in this amazing presentation that you put together, Congress could say, hey, uh, we're writing this bill. Each American, and this is, each American gets $70,000. And what they could do, the Treasury, as you just explained, that whole process, they could ask the Fed for the money, and they could, the Treasury could do it. And then as, as they did in all that, that great presentation of uh, construction company A, they're with Wells Fargo. They could just go, because we've all filed tax returns, and they know where all of our banks are, and they could just go, here you go. Here's 70 grand to get you through this pandemic. We're going to lock the country down for six months to flatten the curve. And everyone would go, you got it. They could yep. do that, and Congress won't. Congress won't. They do what they are told to do, and they are given way too big of a mandate, which is why they can do bad stuff, bailing out too big to fails and so on. Now, next, please. We should also be angry at the Supreme Court because the Fed is a confusing institution. It has some very big questions about its very nature, mm -hmm. which is all, you know, people get into these conspiracy theories and whatever, you know, stuff that they think about the Fed. There are, const there are serious constitutional questions about the Fed, and the Supreme Court for more than 100 years will not litigate them, or um, maybe a little bit, litigate's not the term, will not decide on them. So it's just leaving it out there confusing. However, the one thing that's not confusing is that the Fed, as far as issuing currency is concerned, is under the command of Congress. That's without question. But that's but there's you know the, the the Federal Reserve is not just that. It's a lot of other things. We should also probably most of all be angry with the elite because they use their money to take everything away from us, including our government, our courts, uh, our banks, and they crush us. They use it to disintegrate our society and to crush us. So I think that's probably where the most anger deserves to be. I think uh, next, all of us should just blame the elites for anything that's bad. Because at the end of the day, you could trace it back to the ruling class. I mean, I'm serious. Your phone doesn't get reception. I don't dis necessarily Bla disagree. Blame them. I'm t they're out of something at the store. Blame them. Blame them for anything that's not working right because all they have done yeah, it is sat around and figured out how to squeeze every nickel out of us so that they can have another $150 million home like Jeff Bezos bought in Los Angeles. Well, at least, anyway. but at least he offered $10 million for, uh, for whatever, well, coronavirus relief or whatever. No, climate change relief, $10 billion. How much damage has he and his company done? Do you, I have a strange feeling it's been a little more than $10 billion. That's my guess. And, I'm, and if his, we want to go his, to Even his cloud computing, even his cloud computing, how much, how much, how much CO2 oh, does that spew out? It's, he could have... And $10 million, wow, that's a lot of money to you and me. Let's break that down in percentage. What percentage of $158 billion is $10 million? It's literally, Jeff, like, I I'm sure if you had a calculator, we could figure this out pretty quickly, but I'm guessing it's somewhere in the neighborhood of me going, Jeff, you're having a hard time. Here's eight bucks. Yep, probably. It's in that probably. neighborhood. And this is a guy and how who... He yep, could, yep, yep, yep. If he wanted to fix climate change, you know what he could do? He could say, all my facilities are going green. Recycled packaging, solar panels, everyone's getting union wages, everything, all my, 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 all my trucks now, I'm buying a whole fleet of American union-made electric vegetable oil, whatever the fuck truck he wanted to make, he could get it done, he could do that overnight. He could end homelessness overnight. He could do all of that overnight. But, oh, we should be so great that Lex Luthor gave us $10 million. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, go fuck, fuck the yeah. elites. Any, if you have a bad dream, you didn't get enough sleep, blame the elites. Your toe hurts, blame them. Blame them for everything, every moment of every day. Sorry, go ahead. I don't, I don't necessarily disagree. No, uh, next slide, please. And I think we should also blame us. We've fallen asleep. 
we expect a savior to, to we expect wow. someone to save us. Mm-hmm. We don't stand up and demand better. We get fooled. We, we pretend that the news is the news and we don't look beyond it. We don't ask questions. We don't pay attention to the suffering of millions. And we keep on letting, allowing ourselves to be tricked by people who fi- hide behind economic falsehoods. So probably not primary, but I don't think that we should, you know, pretend that we're blameless either, either. No, you're right. We all we all have to ask ourselves, what was my part in this? And no, we don't have, you and I don't have the power of the ruling elites, but where there's more of us, the 99% is more. And it's why you're doing this. It's why I started doing this show. It's why people are coming to watch this show here rather than watch the bullshit on the corporate media. If you want to watch corporate media, great, but just know I watch it to go, oh, this is the lie they're telling me today. This is what they're trying, this is the part propaganda they're pushing today. Oh, this is, oh, what are we not talking about? Hey, exactly, that's even... That's the key. What are yeah, we not where, where are all the about? homeless people that you're investigating? Yeah, we're, 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 right. what are we not talking about today? Oh, we're not talking about the fact that Los Angeles has the cleanest air it's ever had. The whole world's yep. air is the clean. We're not talking about that. We're not, oh, we need to do something with, with homeless people with COVID. We could fix. We why didn't we fix that before COVID? Why aren't we? We're not talking about Epstein. We're not talking about any of that stuff. So yeah, there is. We have to take some responsibility on this for sure. And I, I agree with that. We all have and to. And I, I actually think, I actually think that Bernie supporters, in a sense, Bernie supporters, are starting that. Meaning, yeah. we we acknowledge in a way. I acknowledge in a way that I have somehow contributed to the systemic horribleness. And that this is sort of, you know, with Bernie, the movement and all is sort of our way of trying to change ourselves and trying to change our politics. I, that's how I see it. No, it's a, it's a good point. And I think all of us, you know, have felt completely sort of let down or betrayed or whatever, um, whatever, whatever personal emotion you had at him endorsing Joe Biden and watching these ridiculous videos with him and Biden. Um, but the thing that I'm seeing from it, I, I don't think the Democratic establishment realizes that this ain't 2016. Where seventy-five percent of Bernie supporters voted for Hillary, this is a, this is going. They're going to get about twenty to twenty-five percent of Bernie supporters. Hillary's Hillary's brain is not turning to oatmeal. You no. can say a lot of things about her, but her brain is not turning no. to oatmeal. And and the thing is, is like I understood the people who were inspired to vote for the first female president. I understood the power of that. Obama was the first black. It looks good. It's like wow, we even though she's not perfect, I just want to have a female president finally so we can say that it's possible. I understood that. I didn't vote for her, but I understood that. There's no, there's no excitement around a fucking rapist with dementia. There's no, there's no, there's no like, yay, the first corrupt white guy. <laughs> there's- right. It's like, it's like they, don't want to, they don't want to stop the corruption. They want to make the corruptors more diverse. Yeah. And, and first woman president, first black president. But I think the thing that, the thing that is happening with the complete letdown of Bernie, not take seizing the moment in, in history that he had, and we should all right now we could be talking about oh Bernie's going to be our next president, but he didn't he didn't want to do that for whatever reason. Um, but I think all of us <sighs> Bernie supporters are like okay great now we're all done with the Democratic Party and now we have to take some responsibility for this and ask ourselves our what's my part in it? I always got to ask in a, in a problem, in a situation, in a breakup, in a whatever what's my part in this? And, uh, you know, I wasn't expecting Bernie to be some savior, but I was, we all put a lot of faith in that, that movement and everything else. Great. It's done. Now we gotta, we gotta take more charge as you're talking about here, which, which is very, very valid and, and not like a shaming thing, but like, mm, we, we, we gotta, we gotta look in the mirror a little bit and we have. Well, I, I see the whole thing as, you know, MMT is the truth about economics. If you don't learn the truth, you can't, you don't know which direction to go in. Right. So it's just acknowledging the truth and just a different kind of truth. Uh, Next, please. So just a couple of things, last things I want to say. And again, this is all just my opinion. So I just find it interesting that all these companies, the banks, the big businesses and all this, they scream free market. They call themselves private businesses. And yet how often do they run crying to the central government to be bailed out? Of course. None of them have yeah, any they, savings. They, scream, they tell all of us get, to have savings, and they don't. Right. They get work. government off our backs. Government's the problem. Yeah. So if a company really has to run to the central government, are they really private? And were they ever really private to begin with? Mm-hmm. Let alone, how did they get their stuff to begin with? How did we get our land? Did, did, did what you know, blood of, of uh, Native Americans and on the backs of slaves, right? What's the history of that land? You know, do we have a right to claim ownership of that land? Even me and you. Right. What we have, you know, we're not, we're not 
you know, racist or have slaves in our house, but what did our ancestors do to, to get this place? You know, that's just a whole other subject. Uh, next, please. Um, so, yes, again, your point. The elite the, steal from us, harm us as individuals, and then they turn to our government and use our public money, not our tax money, or not our individual tax money, our public money as a collective to bail out these criminals. Then they turn to us, the millions and millions of suffering, and sadly fret about tough choices and fiscal responsibility even during this crisis. And then the elite steal from us again. It just goes over and over and over again. Next, please. The government is us. The government is us as a collective. Its money is our money. Its power is our power. And its military is our military. The elites steal from us as individuals, and then they steal from us again as a collective. So every crime they commit against us is basically doubled. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that, that's not a clean ending, but that's that's it. Thank so on the last slide, I have uh, I just have if if your viewers want to learn more, uh, I've been particularly talking with Joe Firestone, who taught me all of this stuff, um, and he's pretty amazing. But all these people are amazing and know about this particular subject. Uh, so on these guys are on Twitter. Um, uh, if you if you want to learn more about it, so thank you. You know. You, you are getting stuff right, and now it's you know now we've we've had to to go significantly deeper. And I actually had uh, I I did some serious cramming, <laughs> so I can make sure that I have my head around it because it's it's intense stuff. It's really intense stuff, and I didn't I didn't understand no it's uh, quite a lot. It is oh. intense stuff, and I appreciate you doing taking the time and the research, uh, Jeff, and coming on this show and educating me, which then educates the fans, the followers, and the viewers of this show. Because uh, that's what I'm all about here. I just want to inform, inform people and make them laugh on occasion. Uh, so I really appreciate the time. Please uh, listen to the uh, Activist MMT podcast uh, and also Citizens Media TV. And again, this is in my MMT playlist. So if you want to learn more about MMT, I've got a whole playlist of videos. I've even interviewed this gentleman here, Stephen Hale. Uh, and there's a great interview with Fidel Kabuba, and I'm going to try to get them both back on the show. Uh, but, Jeff, thank you so much for being on the show and taking time out to uh, share us this information. Everybody out there, uh, follow at ActivistMMT on Twitter and listen to that podcast, and like, share, and subscribe to videos, and uh, you're all making Gotham great again. Grant, thank you so much. You are doing great, great work. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks, brother. Doing what I can. <laughs> in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everybody. Hey, everybody. Like, share, and subscribe. Hit the bell notification button and the subscribe button, even if you've done it before because they're unsubscribing, many of you, every day. Watch the ads all the way through. If you click skip ad, I don't get paid. Also, support us at patreon.com slash Elwood or rockfin.com slash Elwood. Rockfin.com is a blockchain cryptocurrency platform. All my videos are on Rockfin ad free. Thanks for watching.